I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is a special session of the Board of Trustees of North Idaho College. There is a quorum present. Yes. So would you all join me with the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to once again welcome Dr. Plumback. You're here. You've met all the board, uh, the trustees. Have you had a chance to see any of the Zoom, of any of the other sessions with candidates? I have not. Thank you. And have you seen this list of questions at all? I have not. These are going to be our questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. As a procedure, we're going to ask you these 10 questions, taking turns asking them. <clears throat> At the termination of those 10 questions, then trustees will be able to ask individual questions, either related to that or other related subjects. So I will start. Question number one. Understanding the mission and vision of North Idaho College, walk us through what you believe are the most important elements of being a visionary president of NIC. Describe how your leadership style and approach will support a climate of engagement, accountability, and healing. Thanks for the question. Um, what I think are the most important elements of the visionary president is to really focus on how um, we focus, uh, how we focus on engaging with the community, uh, particularly around how we bring students into education that can lead to jobs, careers, and the future that they're after and why they come to us. And so I think building our systems around really focusing the, the students and how as, a, as an institution at every level, all the, pe all the people that work here, how they can support that mission and really look at how each person is teaching things and to students and to students are learning from them. I think that's incredibly important to the vision uh, of the president going forward and, and, and of any president. And that is that really the focus on we have relevant first rate programs of high quality and that we have uh, students that are, can successfully complete them, that they're unique and they're important and relevant to the student population and the community, particularly the workforce components. And I think that when I look at the mission and vision, that's what I see as the, as the key elements towards what NIC is trying to do. Uh, and that it's, it should be the focus of all the things that happen across campus at every level. Uh, I'm a, I mean, I already said this once, but I really uh, am firmly devoted to the idea, uh, and I don't think it's the idea, it's the action of every person on campus is here to educate students. Every single person is involved in their success, and every student needs to feel connected to a campus, and it doesn't matter who those people are, there's somebody that they'll connect with, and that's an important part of how you, how you build student success. Uh, and that doesn't matter if they're in the classroom, they're the advisor, they're the president, they're another administrator, but that's, if it's anybody on campus, the facilities team, doesn't matter. Those people are who fulfill and help live the vision and connect students to their futures. In terms of my leadership style and approach, uh, I believe in uh, innovation, creativity, transparency, trust, um, and collaboration. So those are my main items in terms of how it is that I would support engagement. I believe you have to build trust and, and confidence, and I have to do that as a president. I would have to build that with, with the team. Uh, at the same time, I have to put, put my trust and confidence in them to build around. I can't do everything, would never even dream of it. And they are the ones that would be engaging in the climate. They're the ones that would be trying to find a fun climate. I believe in fun as an opportunity to be, uh, it raised the climate, but it also helps when there's the hard work to be done. Fun is an important component of that. And looking at those areas really about trust and collaboration and trying to build and transparency, tell people why decisions are made so that they can be, make the decisions themselves. That creates a better accountability um, and so that they're leading, they're in charge, they get to be, you know, they're trusted to do their job the way they know how to do it, uh, and they're meeting the mission that we're hoping to, to, to follow. 
Uh, in terms of healing, I think that it goes a long way to build transparency, tell people what's going on, why it's going on, uh, but involving them in the problem solving. How do we how do we face our challenges? How do we ex take uh, take advantage of opportunities? Those are all really important parts of healing. How do we how do we engage? How do we validate what people uh, have gone through, particularly during a pandemic where we're separated from each other? We need to get reconnected in those ways. Um, you know, there's lots of things like that that you know I think building some fun in there, but also trust, confidence, collaboration, uh, and then I think. I believe firmly in innovation and entrepreneurship, and I think that provides fun, but it provides opportunities to solve problems in new ways that create incredible opportunities for an institution. Okay. Greg, will you take question number two, please? Oh, I'll let you go. Would you rather I did it for you? Yes, sir. I'll do that for you. Question number two. How would you reestablish a positive public image with our community and business partners to continue and evolve our efforts to best prepare and sustain the region's workforce? Yeah, I think to, to reestablish positive public image uh, or to create that in any way is all about relationships and partnerships. And I think the best way to go into doing that is, is I would, you know, I'm, I'm not from here, so I would have to go and meet people to build those relationships, to be listening to what it is that they say the institution can do uh, together with those partners. Uh, particularly when we talk about community and business, they, you know, those are the organizations that have, uh, that, that are touching us that, that also need uh, they need a workforce. They need people to be prepared to go to work for them. Uh, and listening truly in a partnership, how do we develop our programs? Maybe some of them are non-credit, some of them are credit, you know, different ways of doing that. How do we help them solve the problems they're facing and collect and jointly we can solve some of our enrollment things that we're worried about and other opportunities there. But ultimately, I think it's about coming out with a partner, listening to how we can help serve, but also to just tell people what's happening, what does it mean going forward? You know, our accreditation, it's a concern, but that at the same time, we're handling it, we're addressing things, we're moving forward. Um, we're a place they can put their confidence in, their credits will transfer, their opportunities to explore higher education will still exist. We gotta tell them that. We can't assume that they'll know. You know, that's already something, colleges are kind of a complicated place. If you're not around it and it's internal, you gotta go tell, they don't necessarily, you don't just know. You have to go tell people about it. And I think going out, building those relationships, telling people who we are, what we're going to do, what we're going to continue to do, as we always have, uh, and how are we going to continue to serve the region and the community and the workforce partners. Those are all really important pieces of building a positive image. How are we serving our, our area? Uh, you know, service to others is really a key component of entrepreneurship. That's what we're trying to do, serve others, provide opportunities for them to get a benefit, to have the benefit in the long term, the community be better if we have better prepared students, people are ready to meet the workforce needs that exist today and into the future. And all of those things combined, I think, help establish a positive public image. Thank you. <clears throat> question number three. Yes. What type of programming and curriculum innovations have you implemented to increase student retention Completion, graduation, and persistence rate. Yeah. So uh, student success is my passion. So I think about all the time, we think about retention, completion, graduation, and persistence. So first thing you need to know is where you stand. Those are all data points that you can know. And you can see where are you in those things. Uh, what it ultimately comes down to is though being very intentional about how you address certain components of retention, uh, in retention in, in particular, retention leads to completion, leads to graduation uh, in those pieces. So what we've done, what I've done in the past is a, a couple of things. Um, we implemented a, or I've been directly involved with implementing complete, the Complete College America initiatives, which are items like um, try, getting students through their first uh, college math and English courses in their first year, 
a momentum year where you promote relevant courses of study in their first year, in their first semester, in their first year. To give you an example why that's important, if a student comes out uh, to sign up and they want to be a welder, uh, they don't want to spend a bunch of time in classes that, isn't, aren't, that aren't welding. They want to take a welding course in addition to taking um, other things that are required for them, like a math and English. So you put those in there. Uh, you encourage 15 to finish. Uh, you create academic pathways or academic maps, which are really the curriculum guide, and it tells them the default path so they know exactly what they need to do to get to completion. Um, and you also have to create effective and efficient course schedules so that a student can take every semester on that map. 15 to finish basically says you take 15 credit hours every semester, you'll finish in two years because you're going to do that in four semesters. It's really important then that not only does the map exist, but that it's tested against your schedule and there's an opportunity to actually take that, that path. So with all of those things combined, essentially I've seen significant successes around retention. At the time before we implemented that, uh, those items we had, and we went all in at the same time. All those things happened in one moment, not in one piece after another. They all went in at one moment. But putting all those pieces in place, we went from like a 50%, uh, approximately 50% retention rate fall to fall to initially went up to almost 76%. Um, which is pretty unheard of for a community college, uh, but it works. Now, that was a little unrealistic in the long term. That was the initial boost. It settled into usually somewhere between 60 to 65 percent uh, retention rates, which have led to, to persistence rates that are increasing in, in higher graduation rates over time. Uh, so just to give you an idea, putting those initiatives in place. Uh, another big area um, that I've been, that I was, you know, launched was the uh, replication of CUNY's um, City University in New York's uh, ASAP program, which is the goal of it is to increase the graduation rates of associate degree students within uh, two years or, or right, right on time, which they say is three years. So we try to increase it. That is a research based model that works. Uh, they proved basically that they could double it, I think, in their first cohort, essentially, they doubled their graduation rates. So we were funded um, by a private donor foundation to create that at, in a rural campus. CUNY's obviously in a great big city. Uh, we're in a rural campus. Uh, it's been replicated at several other places, California, Ohio, uh, Nashville, I believe. And it works. It works in all those places. But basically what we've seen as a result of that model, what it does, the biggest piece it puts in place is proactive advising um, and some financial incentives to get people to participate in it. But proactive advising involves initially the students have to meet with their advisor twice per month to be connected to the resources that are available on campus that really focus in on their pathways. They're always talking about the things that are getting in their way, removing barriers. And basically what we saw there is that a four semester, we've gotten the first pilot group of that has started there and they just finished their fourth semester in spring 2022. We saw that 68% of that group, four semesters later, were um, still in college, or there was another group that had graduated on time in the two years. But that 68% of them, compared to the comparison groups of students that could have been just like them, uh, were at about 31%. So you're talking about double, more than doubling the number of students that are involved in that program versus their ones not involved in it that are, that are still in college, still completing and on time, increasing it, they're completing three or um, prox or they're averaging at least three credit hours more completion every semester so like at least six credit hours so another class every semester and you're seeing significant gains in those opportunities and that's really i think what we call proactive advising there's the other word is intrusive advising uh, we moved it to proactive because it sounds nicer but intrusive advising where you're really going out and looking at data and seeing if students do these things, they have a higher success rate. So let's put people, advisors, and everybody can be advisors. But in this particular model, we're talking about a particular group that are assigned to the same students through their journey. And then having them meet and be proactive or intrusive and in saying, hey, looks like you're slipping here in this science course. Why don't you, you need to, you know, I'm meeting with you this month for the second time, go tutoring, see what happens and then tracking back to see if it actually works. These have increased persistence and retention rates significantly over the period. So 
Uh, those are a couple of major initiatives I've done in that series. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Trustee Banducci is not here, so I will read his question number four. What would be your short-term strategy to increase enrollment in the current competitive lands? Yes, that's a question everywhere in the country. What do we do in the short term to increase enrollment? Um, and, you know, one of the hardest things to do is focus uh, on the fall in June and July and August. Uh, so, you know, that's the short, if that's the short term, well, there's like all hands on deck trying to figure out how to provide opportunities to get students in for the fall. I think a little bit longer, but still short term, is to start focusing really by the time fall starts or soon after, maybe September, you begin, that's when you focus on your next fall. Now, you probably are still going to focus on your spring and your summer before that, but you got to start looking at traditional student populations and really setting, not only having a mindset that the institution is should be a top choice or a first choice for education in your area, but also acting like it in all the ways. I'll say you're acting like it. You walk around this place, uh, you see the buildings, the shape they're in, the people that you're gonna run across, you're acting like a first rate institution. That, and that's not just acting, you are it. And sharing that when you go to look at, um, at the high schools and you're talking about what you're gonna do in those areas, that's gotta go out there to the counselors and the principals and the superintendents and really pushing that message that you're looking for you're sharing, you're providing an opportunity for a first rate education, just like four year, four year institutions start looking for their next fall this fall. That's, and I'm sure we're doing that, but that's a really important piece is really plugging that in and looking at how you do, do that. The other thing is really truly listening both the workforce partners and the students about what they want and what they need. Workforce partners, they know what outcomes, what student learning they're expecting when they start. Right now, the research is showing essentially that the, the hard skills or the technical skills, they're good with that, but that's on their list of wants right now, they're, that's at the, near the bottom. What, they're really, what they really want are critical thinking, problem solving, uh, analytic minded people uh, to start. So then they can start to train them and evolve them in the uh, technical skill development. So we have an opportunity to do both pieces here. That's what's unique and great about a community college is that you have the opportunity to provide those what we used to call, you know, soft skills, but probably are more likely to be a dur durable skill or uh, those kinds of things and create those while also having all the great technical programs. You know, I don't have been to those facilities, but I'm looking forward to visiting them tomorrow um, they, with the tech technical education. Those are going to be great opportunities. Those are incredible opportunities to lead, uh, you know, people into those, into those jobs. But ultimately, the education, the training we provide should lead to jobs. That's what people are here for. They're trying to get to that. Is it the, and I think we have to train them beyond just the first job. We got to give them some of those durable skills that are then transferable over life, lifelong learning so they can keep plugging back in. And if we can provide those opportunities, truly connect the non-traditional students around, in particular that group maybe, around how they can be reskilled, retooled, have more schools, schools more skills, to take the new jobs that are available today. Those are all really important short-term strategies. There's a lot to do with that, but it's a lot about listening and partnering and, and, and building relationships to really understand what we need to be doing and how we can plug that in. I gotta tell people about what our, our programs lead to in terms of jobs. If you do that more, there's gonna be more understanding. Young people will be more likely to enter post-secondary. We're seeing less and less young people thinking it's something they need to do. Uh, and because there are, a lot, there are opportunities out there. Uh, but those things will help drive that lifelong, that career-oriented uh, approach for students, but they have to see how that connection is. They can't delay it very long. The world's getting more complicated and more expensive, and they need to be able to get there and hit the ground running. So uh, those are what we need to do and be able to provide for them. Thank you. <clears throat> John, would you take question number five, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Give us an example of innovative strategies that you've deployed to retain and attract high-performing talent. Yeah, um, I, well, I don't know. Maybe it's innovative in its uh, simplicity, but I think often we forget to provide the opportunity for our high-performing talent to know that there's another opportunity present. So we end up with 
big searches or the first time they learn that there's an opportunity they could have taken a project is when it's posted it publicly as a which is a good thing but that we could have enabled them to work on a project and create those opportunities for themselves the high performers tend to like rise to the top but there are others that aren't aware that there are opportunities to take more projects and i think the more energy that they can put into succeeding around a project creates more opportunity for them to stay um, more job satisfaction more satisfaction with the institution but for me a big piece is i like to add fun i already mentioned that i like to add fun into the work work is hard if you can you can work hard and have fun i learned that from my dad uh, he was an hvac guy and we used to spend time in the summers on mall roofs and he was always laughing and playing around it was used to be eight trillion degrees on top of those but we were having a good time i had to do that when i was a youth but uh, the reality was you can learn how to work hard, do the work hard, but you can also have fun while doing it. And that creates a lot of opportunity for people to stay. That's how you help, you know, attract and retain them. Um, is that it has to be a fulfilling role. If they're just doing the task from A to Z, you know, they're going to lose, lose interest. And there's lots of opportunities for people to go other places. But fun's an important part and build it into the culture. It's built into the work. Uh, there were times we actually um, had done things like game shows and uh, skits for new people when they came in and when we did it in, in, in professional development. So we would do some pedagogy and those kinds of trainings, but also do things like put people in teams to get to know each other better, but also perform skits. I know that that's kind of, uh, you know, it's different than maybe you might be expecting, but it helps build teams and teams like to stay together. And I think those are neat ways to really and, and attract talent and retain talent in that way. Thank you. How would you describe the financial condition of NIC? Where would you focus your attention? Provide us the best examples that reflect your ability to manage, to manage NIC finances today and post pandemic. Um, so from what I've seen in the financial condition, it looks strong. Uh, it looks like, uh, you know, the budget actually has increased this year, this coming year. Uh, I think that's a really positive sign. Uh, it looks like, you know, things are coming, they're in good shape to invest in the future opportunities. And I think that's a really strong position to be in. Uh, there's a lot of community support for the activities of the institution. Uh, you know, I heard that, um, the state has appropriated a significant amount of money for deferred maintenance, which I think is a big opportunity as well uh, to you know take care of those kind of facilities. And I think those things are really important to, to students and, and really to overall uh, climate and atmosphere. Uh, but so where would I focus the attention? The, the main area that, that we can increase in, it looks like, has to do with uh, tuition revenue. So tuition revenues linked to enrollment. And I think that's the key, that's kind of the key point. How do you drive more enrollment into that? And I think that's the the, the investment that you make has to be driven towards how can you grow your enrollment, stabilize your enrollment, and those kinds of pieces. So I think that's where the main areas are. Post-pandemic, uh, there's a lot of opportunities in the world uh, to grow programs to make better opportunities for higher education. Uh, and being poised, it looks to me to invest in that. It's time to make those calls and look at what, what that next thing is. There are others that have already now tried to catch up with things they're missing and um, you know everybody is now becoming accustomed to the convenience of online learning or zoom calls and those kinds of things but how do we really maximize those opportunities how do we look at the application of learning will involve that enrollment growth there um, <clears throat> so i'll give you a couple examples of, of that how i can manage finances I look at everything as a return on investment. We should be doing things that are driven towards those goals that we have. If our goals are increased enrollment, which I don't know very many institutions that that isn't their, their goal, then what we do, what we spend our money on ought to be focused on that. But also, you know, we want to also be engaging in our community. So spending money on those components as well. So let me give you an example of the technology gains. I think I call uh, what the pandemic has given us, whether we wanted it or not, was a rapid expansion into technology and instruction. If you were already in it, you felt pretty decent about it. If you weren't in it very much, it was, it's been a harder, harder path. 
But one of the things that we did see was that, and we continue to see, is that people want to be able to interact in a live way. Well, Zoom has become an incredible opportunity for that. Teams, Google, whichever one you use, those are all really good opportunities. But how do you maximize the effectiveness of that in a classroom? It was the question that I started to have actually pre-pandemic. Um, and, and partly because of my own instructional background, I, like to take, I wanted to provide opportunities for students to have flexibility. Uh, when I started the legal studies program, I only had five students and I tried to build them up. I wanted to have a sustainable program, but I only had so much of me to go around and teach all the courses. So I had to provide an opportunity for students to attend in different ways. Uh, and so I looked at technology in the classroom and I originally started actually using something called Google Hangouts on air. If anybody even remembers what that is, Google Hangouts on air, which live broadcasted your course. And I used a little, you know, little cheap um, webcam. This was back many, several years ago. And I would teach my class streaming it live to, um, to my students so they could log in and participate that way no matter where they were. I had some students in class with me as well. So I was teaching, it was aimed at the whiteboard. Uh, they're not videos I love to watch myself anymore uh, because there was, there was just, it was just like my back as I was writing on the whiteboard. But in any event, that was an idea that I had to build core classrooms that enabled you to instruct in that way that didn't have a little tiny webcam and had something that would follow you or at least could listen and hear into you. So during the pandemic with the opportunity to enhance facilities because students weren't around in the rooms, uh, I actually had built, I took about $120,000 and built um, 12 Zoom rooms with it. And the Zoom rooms have televisions on both sides, cameras that point at the, at the classroom and at the, at the instructor. Uh, it enabled you to use Zoom to broadcast to a classroom here and, and at a distance, which originally the idea was it to an alternate camp. We have another site, but in the end, it turns out we can Zoom that people to people in their cars, the library, the coffee shop, wherever they might be uh, in the lobby. Uh, and so doing that with that budget, that's how much money I had. And I really wanted to outfit the whole thing. And the reason I, I say that as an example of how you can really maximize what you're trying to do with limited resources, we only have so much money, is to uh, truly look at how we can uh, make that happen at a, at a cheaper rate. So at the time we used to have this one like proprietary system and it was a big screen with the webcam on it. And in order to participate in the other side of that, you had to have the same thing. And they're like 15 or $20,000 a piece with a month yearly subscription. Mm -hmm. Well, I could have got like for $20,000, I would have got like maybe six of those, right? And <coughs> be able to provide the opportunity to everybody using those, those expenses or using what I had, I was able to do that to 12. Now we have those rooms, they're available being used all the time now. Um, we have meetings in them, things that we really weren't doing pre-pandemic that we're able to do with, with not very much money to do it effectively. Uh, I realize that's kind of a small example of, of the money, but that's how I look at it. How do we return and advance? What are we trying to do with our funds? And how are we focusing into that specific goal? And we can go a long way and we know people, um, or, you know, can, can do a lot with limited budgets. They do it all the time. That doesn't mean we don't want to add more to them, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity really to, to manage the finances. Uh, my experience, I'm, I'm the provost, so I'm over academic and student affairs. I have, you know, about two thirds of the institution reports to me directly or indirectly. So, uh, you know, we have like a, I think, institutionally, that probably means that there's somewhere around $15 million is in my, you know, in, into my budgeting, I manage a couple million dollars in grant budgets every year in addition to my regular operating office budget. So that's something I'm familiar with. I also use a limited amount of Perkins funding to, to do a lot with building tech ed programs uh, and professional development for faculty and staff. So that's a pretty normal mix of, of what I do in the budgeting side. Thank you. <clears throat> Question number seven. Describe your fundraising experience. <clears throat> what will be your approach to building successful donor relationships in our region? Yeah, so um, I'll tell you that one of my, so one example, I once ran for family court judge 
and so I had to fundraise for my own political campaign. So uh, I think there's nothing quite as humbling as, as being on your own, by yourself and asking people for funds uh, on, a, on a vision of how you're going to operate. And I think that's, uh, you know, I have that experience, uh, you know, it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of conversation. And uh, so I have that experience. It's in terms of institutionally, I think the approach to building, uh, one, it's having relationships, getting people involved, knowing them. Don't just be coming to them asking for, asking for the funds but seeing how you can partner, how you can create opportunities, again, for students. How can we do, use our money to the best uh, return on it? But also, I think an important piece of how you build those relationships in any region uh, is around showing successes. So having programs, having things that you've done, so you pilot them, you show that there's a success with it. And I think success breeds support. And, you know, we know that, um, and I, you know, we know that businesses support winners. That's what they, they support winning products, they support winning programs, they support winning at all levels. I mean, that's why they heavily invested in sports for that matter. Uh, but they will, also, they will also support and invest in winning in academics. They know how important that is. They know how important education and training is to their needs. And when you show things like uh, the example I gave of, of the ASAP replication that we have, uh, you know, we got that as a result of the first thing I said about increasing using the CCA initiatives and increasing those and having those successes. That was a key piece to a found, private foundation supporting this major replication of a program that they contributed significant money for. And then the pilot of that, the first year success of that was attached by another private foundation contributing another amount. And that's all related. And I think showing that you can, you're not just going to, you don't have a, just a dream for what you spend the money on, but you show how you can step to that and show successes and how you can build those, um, build those programs that are meaningful, that have success, that work. The money follows that. You know, major corporations have lots of money at their disposal for things that they're willing to support. And you got to prove to them that what you do is works and that there's something to win. They don't really like to take very many chances. There's venture capital and all the other, uh, you know, angel investing that do those kinds of things. But you want to get those things to support from companies, from foundations. They like to support those things that work. And I think you have to prove that they work. I know you got to find the seed money, but you got to, you can find it from various places. You can do it uh, entrepreneurially. You build small wins and Hopefully, there's a saying in entrepreneurship is that you want to fail fast and cheap or not fail at all. And, uh, and that's a really big piece to how you build into that. Uh, and I think if you can start showing those successes, if you take a small cohort and start doing the things that I talked about with student success and, and really creating academic pathways and professional advising, you can show success for that. And it gets support because it works. You, you keep 20% more of your population, that's significant. That's 20% less you have to recruit. Recruit's hard. You already have the ones you can retain. It's all hard, actually. But. Thank you. Question number eight, Pete. What successes have you had in lobbying with regional, state, and national politicians, and how will you employ these strategies at North Idaho College? Yeah, um, you know, I think similar, uh, you know, the th similar thing happens in pol in, in, for politicians. And when you're talking about, you know, really lobbying uh, those groups, it's really important, again, to have successes. There are so many uh, federal grants and state grants that are available all the time. You know, there's a, like, grants.gov is full of a new release of a thing. And, and everyone's competing for those dollars. And some of those things are really expensive. Um, but I think an important, again, goes back to, like, what they're looking for when they score those is that you've actually had success with the prior things. So I think, again, uh, that's a really big component to it. But it, you have to pay attention to people and in, in the policymakers. You have to pay attention to them when you don't need anything. You need to be telling people what you're doing, what your successes are. And I think building those relationships is a really important of the lobby. Um, the successes we've had, uh, you know, I think we had a major project that is just about to launch with a corporation we're doing incumbent worker training. Uh, the state basically, in our case, you know, through our legislators, ponied up, I mean, something about a million dollars from the governor's office, another million dollars, or like half a million dollars from workforce development and, 
and no, another million from workforce development, and then like half a million dollars from the higher ed system. And that was all based on this a unique model that engages the workforce side plus the credit side in a program that can that can get degrees for incumbent workers and a whole plant site. And working with those individuals and showing you have these successes, we retain more students. We keep more students, more students complete. We're able to talk to them about that all the time. We didn't ask them for really any money for those programs. When it comes time for this other big thing, is when they know we'll deliver the workforce training. They'll know we're gonna deliver uh, what we say in terms of retaining students, getting them completed, and, and making the curriculum work that, that connects the job, that, that education to the jobs, and the improvements the employer's trying to be get supported really publicly, I think, from those places. So those are successes I've had, significant funds there. But it's really about, you don't just go around them and tell them, they want to be able to say what's great in their state if they're at the national level. They want to say what's great about what's happening in their region. And they need to have that information available and they need to know who you are and that you're trustworthy. I think those are important towards advocating. They know you spend your money wisely. You do it, invest in things that are successful. Then they're more likely to support you too when it comes time to, for them to spend money on that side. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'll read uh, Trustee Van Dushy's question number nine. Tell us your vision for managing change and innovation. What would be your strategy for ensuring that North Idaho College remain the leader and first choice for education in this region? Yeah, uh, so I, I think managing change and innovation is about transparency, trust, communication, collaboration, and so you have to employ all those things and involve everybody in the change. You know, there's, it's said that uh, everybody hates change, right? That's, we all know that. People don't like change, it's human nature. But the thing is change happens when the pain of staying the same is worse than the pain of change. And so that's an interesting part. But so you have to kind of prove that case. You have to say, not that it's all painful, but change is good and change and evolving. If you're not getting ahead, you're getting behind. And there's not really such thing as staying the same. So we have to, you have to move change through collaboration, bring people to in. They see, they see opportunities and challenges and how to fix them and how to work through them in much more broader perspectives than any, even just the, an administrative team is, and certainly more than any one individual. You bring those folks to the table, they see things that happen out in the community. They see things that are happening on the front lines every day. Those are all important to, creating new opportunities. That's ultimately what like entrepreneurship is and innovation. Uh, and so when I look at how do you stay the leader and the first choice for education in your region, it's, it's about listening. It's about paying attention. It's about involving others in the problems, the, the possible solutions, how you can work and really partner together and create, you know, how do you stay relevant is you stay relevant through listening to what they say they need. And if the workforce and partners don't think that you're going to provide what they ask for, they're going to stop partnering with you because they're going to go find somebody that will do what they're needing in terms of the result. There's one thing that we know education does is when you get there, the employer knows whether the person has the skills they expected. They know it pretty quickly. It doesn't take very long and doesn't take very many times that that falls short that then they stop trusting the front. And I think that's a really important piece of really staying that on the employer side. I talked a lot about acting and being and acting like a first choice is a really important point. Act like that. I think that's a, we, you have to have your processes in place. You gotta take care of the details. If you wanna recruit the traditional student and make this their first choice, you have to do that. It is a first choice. It should be the place they wanna go. Their students have lots of opportunities. There's so many choices. Heck, the world became an opportunity major international corporations became an opportunity to be trained and educated. Uh, you know, if you want to do it on your own because you're that good, you don't need any of this. You can Google it and find the, all the resources in the video as well. So we have to provide those unique pieces. We have to connect the people to their specific needs. <coughs> and that's how you stay the first choice. That's how you are the first choice. Okay. Don, do you want to take number 10? There is Chairman. <clears throat> this may not be a fair question because you haven't had a chance to uh, go through Parker yet. 
based on your research at North Idaho College, tell us your impressions of the college, including your most positive impressions and those you'd like to address within the first 90 days. Yeah, um, so, so first of all, it's a, it's a beautiful campus. I, I think um, you all already know that. Uh, it's a beautiful location on top of that. But as I was touring the buildings and being able to see campus, uh, you know, when somebody was leading me around today, uh, one thing I noticed is that the, the institution is like, I, I was surprised to hear the age of some of the buildings because of how nice they are. They've been remodeled and refreshed and made, I can use the word cool, they're made to look cool and they're changing furniture and they're looking at how is it we appeal and make it comfortable for students to be successful. And you can see that in all the places. Uh, that major expansion to the nursing area, that's huge in, in health sciences. Uh, and not just that, expansion is great. But when you think about how, like how the feel is of it, and there's like an indoor outdoor space is that idea on the front. Those are all really like cool factors I think will improve. It improves, I believe, student success because you want to come here, you want to be involved in it. So, uh, so that's one big impression that I have there. I haven't seen Parker, but just from what people like the pride of the pe of people talking about it, I know it's a nice place. I don't, I'm look really looking forward to seeing it tomorrow because I hear it's something else. Uh, and I can just hear it in their voice and how they talk about that, how the place is. So, uh, but I also see that in, in the love for really all the facilities. You know, when you talk about it, it's like, here's the thing we're doing here and here's why we're doing it. Um, people know why, why they're here and what the, what the place is after and what just trying to accomplish. Um, when I look through like the entire comprehensive strategic plan documents and those things, um, and actually a conversation earlier today, uh, they were talking about how some of those documents were really, I mean, they're created around one vision or one process, but that the individual parts were kind of, you know, came up independently. But there was a theme that goes across like the academic plan and the, and the recruiting plan and the facilities master plan that's really neat. And that is that everybody is, even independently, we're thinking about how do we work on getting more students to come here, keeping them successful, building facilities that are nicer for them for that. And that we're putting our we're putting our resources towards those same goals that was like comprehensively existing across all those things and i think that's a really positive impression to me because it means that you're looking at how do you redeploy resources across your campus to serve that need that's that thing you're saying is the vision and the mission of the institution um and those are huge i think uh, that are sitting as really important uh, components of your plan and doing those things, you see people, you know, everybody I met, I can tell that's something they're worried about and they're, and they're working towards and they're, and they're, also, they're, all, they're all pulling in that direction. I think that's really exciting. Um, I also think obviously going out into workforce and trying to figure out and, and connecting more strongly with those programs, being flexible, providing, looking at opportunities to uh, maybe shrink the time to complete those degrees to, to benefit workforce needs I'm, i heard those in conversations those are really exciting to me as well and i think that's those really positive impressions in the institution trying to connect to the community and see how we really can have, have trained education and training lead to jobs um, and so those are all really positive impressions um, so as far as the, the second part of that question um, you know, as it relates to things to address within the first 90 days, obviously uh, there are some accreditation concerns that have to be addressed. And I think, you know, that's, that needs to be done. And I mean, accreditation is key to, to everything that happens in higher education. So uh, that's obviously a big component. We have to shore up some, some uh, important positions across campus and figure out what to do with those. Those are all things, you know, we gotta have personnel in order to, to lead, lead the college in and do the important work. And so those are all really important, 90, I mean, 90 days out. The other pieces of, uh, you know, people needing to think about healing, how are we going to, what are we gonna do next? What, are, what is our, you know, what is our next goal? What are we hoping to accomplish across campus? And how are we gonna be the institution we wanna be? Um, those, are, those are the three big things. We got accreditation, um, you have some key personnel issues, but things that you gotta fill those positions, you gotta have people in place to do that. So that's, that's where I am. Thank you. Before we enter into the individual questions, are there any questions we can answer for you? Sure. Um, so 
This is a question I haven't had an opportunity to ask you all. What, what do you feel is unique about MSC? I wouldn't, <clears throat> excuse me. I wouldn't say unique, but one thing that's a pride is the the culture of NIC. You know, it's a family culture. Um, you know, the faculty is always willing to help out each other. You know, they care about the students. They care about each other. They care about the college. A great pride. So that's really neat in an organization like this. College is a unique part of the community and a driving force for the community. So I, I think that's a very unique and special. It's a relationship to the community and its ability to move the community forward and the community's feeling about the college. <laughs> and while uh, the community college is state based, uh, it really grew from business people in, in the community. And it's maintained that flavor um, through even non-credit courses, uh, uh, individual students, students, just regular people in this community look to NIC for, for their education, whether it be formal or not. I like that. No matter where you are, NIC gives you opportunity. So. Yeah. You know, wherever you are in stage in life. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I get it. Makes sense. Um, so, what do you think are the, the short term opportunities for NIC? Uh, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and start, I guess. Uh, you know, short term opportunities, you know, some workforce development, some CTE. Um, I would, I would say those are the, the two big ones. I think that we have a very uh, excellent collaborative relationship with four-year institutions. And I, I think we are, are working hard to continue those and expand those. And that's a, a big benefit for the community. <clears throat> the paper today, had a column from the CEO of our uh, health facility <clears throat> uh, looking into the future and the, the critical shortage of, of nurses and, and other health staff. That's one of the pre programs here. And I, th I think uh, uh, short term, anything we can do to bolster the opportunity for students to get into the program and to get through the program we need to do. I think we had a couple of sports that would instantly boost. I think we changed the sports conference. We immediately um, garner goodwill in the community and get more people on campus. So we don't say if you lose down your campus, the buildings are attractive. Uh, it is an atmosphere that people want to be a part of. And I mean, I've lived here for eight, nine years now. In the first four and a half years, I've never came to the campus. I feel like if people, we have a lot of newcomers from out of state and they bring their kids with them, even if they're retired coming up this way. Um, if we just got them on campus, I think it would uh, turn around the enrollment decreases. So. so I'm going to turn uh, question 10 back to you all. What do you think um, should the, what do you think the president should focus on in the first 90 days? You know, I think the what you said, accreditation is a big thing. It's the key thing for me. Yeah. Staffing, staffing, as you mentioned, also mm -hmm. very important. Right in the beginning. <clears throat> and I would agree with the chairman. Uh, the uh, president's cabinet has been kind of decimated, <clears throat> and. Um, the interim president was in charge with filling those seats on a permanent basis where we're waiting for a permanent president. Mm -hmm. And I think that's incumbent on uh, anyone in the, in the position to uh, to get those those leadership positions filled. So, so here's another one. The, so in a couple years, two, three years, maybe longer, 
Um, when you sit back and you think about this this decision, how will you know you made a good one? More students, more students graduating, more students moving on, building jobs within the community, people in the community happy with what's ha happening at NIC, people contributing to what's happening at NIC. Those are things that we can see very quickly and easily that are changing all for the positive. <clears throat> North Idaho College is the only community college in the state that's lost enrollment over the last four years. <clears throat> uh, I think a successful president will turn that around. Our population is going up, so there's no reason that we shouldn't have additional students on campus. Um, and I would measure success by that. And for me, I would say, well, you know, staffing numbers up and enrollment. Just looking when I first got to be a trustee. Uh, there would be I'd say for the first year or two, um, consensus among the staff and the faculty of um, not to say like you know don't have any votes and no confidence or anything but to basically change the culture of um, having a, a committee come together and then the committee ending everyone get a piece of papers and then f have the feeling of why is the point of having the committee when the decision was made before the committee even came up mm -hmm. and and to have that that even sense gone and and actually empower the committee uh, just and just I'd say that's uh, yeah that's a peer, peer evaluation amongst uh, staff up um, I think the let's see so uh, my last question and what is a recent innovation at the college that you are proud of, like that you tell people about? You know. Has anybody told you about Gizmo? Mm -hmm. That's one right there. So if you, if I explain that to you a little bit. That's very innovative and exciting mm -hmm. and new here. Innovation. Gizmo is doing good things. Um, but uh, I'd say, I mean, they just came out with one men's school. Uh, that's where, with the change of the presidency and uh, interim president, uh, basically, there's massive pent up demand for this college to start listening to the community. And the interim president uh, basically right away started to do that. And, that just get that initial success story, like you say, success begets success, and get that word out is is there are um, quick innovation turnarounds that this college can do. That was just one of them, and um, and let us do it again for you. You know, what do you got next for us? And uh, yeah, that was a major success program. Thanks. Thank you for your questions. Yeah. Now, Pete, would you like to start the questioning and we'll rotate amongst the trustees? Uh, yes. Um, since it's come up, you know, President's Cabinet, Provost versus VP, what's your thoughts on the, the best model to have for the President's Cabinet? Yeah, that's a great question. With, I mean, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to qualify it a bit and say I'd like to know better about how the organization, how it would work. 
Um, I am, I actually evolved from a Vice President of Academic Affairs and a Vice President of Student Services. I was the VPAA uh, into a combined role, like, and that's how I became the provost. So I saw that transition. The uh, primary reason for that transition to do that using the provost model, that, that for us had to do with breaking down silos and creating really a pathway to, to communicate and to create better opportunities for students to not get bogged down in the barriers and things like that. So um, I've seen it be effective. A key piece to it is having important people that are still over those areas, um, kind of within it. You gotta have people that, you know, I think you can build the collaboration uh, that amongst really, maybe it's a dean level, maybe it's uh, something in those areas, but I think those are important things I have to know about the organization uh, and how it's working and effectiveness and whether I decided to go to the provost model. I think I can see very benefits to both ways. Um, so uh, I think it really doesn't matter on how, how people work together uh, and how you, you know, what the team's like is an impact in that. And I just kind of, this culture of, sometimes there's a culture of student service and academic affairs are like butting heads, which I know is counterintuitive, but it happens. Um, and that's, you know, where that exists, how it exists, and that was one of the main reasons that I was in that role was to do that. That's why I've done my role was to be kind of trying to bridge that gap. And it works when you need to do that for sure. It also works on the other programs. When I think about student success, I talk about removing barriers to students. And there is, there needs to be a bridge. It's, it's actually, a, it's enmeshed with each other. Uh, how we make students successful is everybody on campus and how we can drive academic programs and student affairs and how those things build together have to be something that's a constant conversation. It's a constant, uh, it can't be uh, us versus them. It has to be that. And I think those are important components to knowing which way. I think the provost model works. I, you know, I think, well, I mean, a lot of institutions, huge institutions have that. Um, but it's an opportunity. I know that it's what we're doing right now and it's been an, it's been an innovation during the, or, innovation, but it's been something that came out as an interim period, right? So uh, it's, I mean, I'd be interested to hear how, how it's worked with the people that have been part of it, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Oh, that's, pardon? Oh, that's. Coeur d'Alene is a beautiful area. There's every reason in the world for everyone to want to come here. But why North Idaho College? Sure. Well, thanks for the question. So obviously, uh, what, what caught my first attention, I got, I got a communication about the opportunity and, you know, obviously the beauty of the area, uh, the beauty of the institution, and, you know, it caught my attention. Um, and I mean, that, I'd be fooling you if I said, didn't say that, because I think you already know that. And it was, heck, it was part of your question. But so that caught my attention. But then as I looked in, you know, obviously there, there are things that maybe are cautions, but as I looked in and see what the opportunities are, the facilities are great. Expansion into work, uh, you know, the workforce education and, and, and technical education. Those are things I'm really interested about and, and, and focus on. And so as I look at the institution and I was thinking about those things in my process, so that's what kind of led me to, to, to apply. Uh, I'm also interested in, you know, I think that, that the benefit of student engagement that comes from the, the robust engagement processes that you have, you know, opportunities that you have for students. Um, you know, athletics is a component, the residential component, those things were all interesting to me. Uh, but why did I put my hat in the ring? I'll tell you, I like where I am. I do like my job. I like being a provost. I think that's a good job. But I also have found that the best things in my life, and I think this is true for, for most of us, hopefully, have been have come at the exit ramp of my comfort zone and so i think i do my job well i know what i'm doing with it um you know i'm always innovating thinking about new things but that's the other reason that's why that's why i'm here right now is i think that those opportunities that an opportunity like this one is is big for me and personally and professionally so that's what leads me to this place right now thank you john thank you mr chairman I see four separate communities at North Idaho College. Students, faculty, staff, and then the board. <clears throat> You're going to have to interact with all those, those uh, uh, communities. Tell me how you do that. Yeah, I mean, I think every part is important and a part of the whole, just like you said. And so I, it's important to be a listener. 
uh, you know, right now, obviously starting out, one of the big things I have to do is listen to everybody, hear what's going on, uh, you know, what is happening for them, what are their concerns, what are their opportunities, what do they see as, as lights of hope. And all the conversations I've had, and even within the questions that have been asked me, I hear hope as in everything that you all are doing. Uh, and, and hope for the future. Pandemic has been a big folk factor. I mean, you know, I think it, it's, uh, people are tired from those things. And so when I think about listening and hearing, how can we work together? We're all trying to do the same thing. Ultimately, that's that's clear. Trying to have do the best for our community, serve our students, get our students the lives they're looking for. What are they after? And, and that's what everybody's role is. And I think, how can we make those things work together is really important. And I and, and, as, and as far as, I think a lot of times there's not, you know, it's, it's understanding what everybody's expectations are about how to do that and how we navigate those things together. Communication is key, transparency is key. Telling people what, what's going on and what they think about uh, and listening is a huge part of negotiating and you know, kind of working through everybody and listening and paying attention and figuring out how we can together advance what we're after in a mission, and, and, that, and that is to serve students and to serve our community at the high level. Thank you. Wait, do you have another question? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, workforce development, CTE, uh, been brought up a couple different times. Uh, please discuss your successes and some of your failures in these programs. Yeah, um, so a big area, I think, in terms of um, a big area in terms of uh, technical education and workforce is uh, really looking at how you can leverage like non credit opportunities. And so I'll give you a couple examples there. One of the things that we saw while working with local manufacturers is that they didn't need people to be completely um, like advanced in their manufacturing knowledge, but they wanted to have them have basic skills and understand what it meant to work on a manufacturing floor. And so uh, those have skills and expectations that are built in and what we did was create a program called basic manufacturing it was a short-term program it was like a four-week course with a with a 12-week um, co-op or we call learn and earn opportunity so they got taught by the curriculum that was developed by the manufacturing group like a second strategy group that talked about what are those basic skills to hit the ground running and then they got an opportunity to bring those students on board there was a paid experience um, for, and so that the students could see what it was like, but it was also the opportunity for them to see if that's for them. So they've learned some of those things that you need to know to hit the ground running, and you have an opportunity basically then to learn what it's like in a facility, and how to work there. And so using that as a success, then the employer was able, and I think they hired everybody to finish. Um, and that was a key piece of a key success to like really tying that together. Um, we've done some other opportunities like that. Um, something called persuas persuasive selling for business is another opportunity. Lots of jobs that are available as entry jobs or sell sales positions. A lot of people don't look at those necessarily as their foot in. That's usually a foot in the door to a lot of a lot of organizations. And um, we created a program very similar to that, based on people that said like you know not how to be a, a salesperson per se, but to understand you know what the practice of sales. Everybody's in sales, whether you want to be a salesperson or not. We have to do that. That's what we do. We have to sell people on our ideas, our experiences, what it is that they that's good for them, uh, you know. And that's what we do. And so we created another opportunity there. And I think that's a good opportunity to tie students really to jobs that are available. You know, there are a lot of those kind of positions available all the time, and they're all across the country. And uh, but there aren't a lot of people that apply for them because they don't think about what that job means and what is it like. So those are a couple of experiences there. Um, Another area, you know, other areas that are how do we, we've created programs like we created an advanced manufacturing technology program, associate degree program by working with a major uh, automotive manufacturer to create a program that enabled their students actually, what they did was they moved from, I think it was about a hundred thousand square foot facility to a million square foot facility. When they did that, they then all of a sudden went from, they had like one maintenance person and it turned that into move to that big size, they needed like something like 20. And so they needed to start building that skill development so that people could they could have a better maintenance crew. We got a lot of people that work on the line and the manufacturing that part, but the maintenance side, they needed to scale up and get a new crew to do that. So with them, we created a program, um, an associate degree program, advanced manufacturing, and the, the company then actually provides the full scholarships for them to do that for the 
get it for two years. Um, they pay them, it's around their shifts and things like that, and it works out pretty well. And they have 15 in their both first cohorts, the 15 in their second cohort. Um, you know, with the pandemic and things like that, they've not gone to the third one yet, but it's up, but now they're looking at other opportunities because of that partnership. So, a couple big examples there. I think some of, not necessarily are they fails, but we've seen kind of a diminishing population of students entering some technical degree programs that used to use them have wait lists for essentially. And for some reason, we're not, I don't know if we've clearly identified what's happening there, but I think some of it, give an example of one that, that happens all the time and it's welding. Uh, there are lots of welding opportunities almost everywhere in the country. And what, what happens for students is that they need the skill and as soon as they get the skill, they get higher. They don't need to finish a degree. So then you have diminishing enrollment in that program, even though you've really met the success indicator. What are we trying to do for students? Get them into jobs. And so they got there, but they, it doesn't look like it on paper. But I think we're not getting as many into those kind of programs because I think they're seeing the timeline to completion is too long. And I think that's a, a huge opportunity. So why are we seeing less people in? I think it's because it takes too long and it's not paid. Who can pause their life to go to a daytime program when they need to have a life? They got to have a job to support their family and, and support their life. And, and so we need to look at how th that's the opportunity I've seen from those kind of things. But we've seen that just mainly, I think, in not re envisioning the idea around how long should it take to finish and build skills. There's a lot of opportunities in that area. Thank you. Great. You have a question? You wish to defer again? I'd like to talk a little bit more about your background with donors. Now, certainly running for public office is the toughest of all ways to go donor-wise. Mm -hmm. Have you had experience, though, uh, institutionally trying to meet with donors and, and uh, develop relationships that way? Uh, my experience isn't, uh, that's not been part of my role in the past, other than to be part of the development of, you know, how the programs would play in. Uh, probably my, my most, and it's pretty recent experience, has to do with the foundation and, and working to develop the opportunity for uh, an endowed chair in entrepreneurialism uh, that I've worked through. That's just about how we're going to deliver the program more on the academic side. So I haven't had a lot of that development there. Um, you know, mine has been more along like really the political side, you know, look, looking at policymakers and talking to them about those things. Uh, a lot of whom, you know, have met partly during campaign seasons and things like that and developing that. So that's been a lot of my, my development on that side. Um, I do serve, I'll say I serve on the board of Goodwill uh, in, in West Virginia. And they're, they're, we're very active in, in that fund development there. I'm not a staff member, I'm a board member, but I participate through you know, some of seeing those fundraising opportunities, how do we connect the mission of Goodwill? They aren't just stores. Most people know Goodwill are stores, but they're stores, but the stores fund training, massive training programs and, and jobs and things like that. So talking, working with people around those things has been some of the stuff I've worked on too, but not a lot other than, you know, my own personal experiences telling people on who I am in that sense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, dual enrollment's a, a, a big part uh, at NIC. Uh, hopefully, but that's a feeder program that brings students on campus. Uh, <clears throat> you indicate that you've uh, made significant uh, strides towards increasing enrollment in mm -hmm. your program. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how that happened? Yeah, it's relationships with with uh, high schools. Uh, and not just the not just the superintendents, not just the principals, but really going and, and working with the counselors and the, and the and the teachers to figure out how is it we can serve those particular needs. They're the ones who know the students. You know, I always say I think the opportunities in recruiting are you got to know like you know what the what the counselors um, kids like to eat almost. You know because you, that's the relationship building that you're trying to do. They're the ones that can easily inform. Um, whether they, whether a student should select or look at an institution, they can also send them not to do that. Uh, that's true everywhere. I've seen that um, before. And so I think really building those relationships and saying, how, how, can we, how can we provide these opportunities to your students 
in a way that works for the high school side and the college side. And so that's been the main thing. It's really about relationships and also um, following, you know, our, uh, we have a pathway model, you know, we have academic maps and we really look at like, here's the program, you want to complete these things and that helps target the students to the particular courses they should take. Uh, we didn't, we have some associate degree opportunities for high school students. Um, I know, um, I haven't talked to a student earlier today that, uh, you know, you can, you can do that. You can get an associate degree here as a, as a dual enrolled or dual credit student. Well, there's a lot of opportunities there, but we actually shrunk it down to a certificate degree so you could see that clear pathway and then build it out. Seeing what you can do there is really important for building the credit and that side. The other piece, the big opportunity, I think, in the future, and that needs to keep happening, and I've seen, we've had a couple of these already, uh, and it has to do with the CTE side. Typically, dual credit has been almost all transfer. It's how do we give, how do we get students college credits while in high school uh, for transfer purposes into four years, typically. But I think the huge opportunity is doing it in, in the CTE side and looking at how is it that we can do it. We've done it with criminal justice as an example. If we have a public in West Virginia, there's a public safety program. You can link it to criminal justice courses and start getting people into the first, you know, they get their first couple semesters of criminal justice. Uh, and a key piece is bringing our faculty to the table and not necessarily teaching the whole course, but also the talking about the opportunity showing up and partnering with the teachers at the CTE level. Um, we've also done it in, um, in uh, advanced medical, which is like pathway into hopefully nursing, but we've been able to put it in the career ladder of health science. And those attract students because they're interested in that particular career path. One of the biggest dangers of dual credit is what is called the credit graveyard. And so you take too many classes, courses, you have too many credit hours and they count for nothing when you rent. I mean, some, many of them will count, but there's whole other ones that don't count. And there's nobody likes to have show up at college and say, it comes to open college and they're like, oh, you still need to take this science. Well, I took that one. You need to take this math. Well, I took that one. And then it doesn't count. That's that's not going to work. So building those pathways, you can't have that bad experience because you're going to sour a bunch with that. But it, those are all really good opportunities. But it's ultimately it's about relationships and talking about how can we help the counselors advise the students in that process. I think college advisors or how do we hope maybe we can help deputize the guidance counselors typically they are they have lots to do already so they don't want more things to do and how we can help them take some of that off their plate i think is really helpful towards creating opportunities for dual credit and height for the high school students and then create clear pathways to college wherever they want to go you know part of it is not just to bring them here but to bring them to you know get them where they want to go and so that's that's advising and figuring it out but that relationship, giving them a good experience also should, as the whole goal, I think, is to have them then matriculate as a regular student at, at NIC in this case. I want to circle back to one of the questions that talked about <clears throat> the financial condition of NIC. Uh, you indicated NIC is in a strong financial position. Uh, and. I apologize for my notes, they may not be the best, but you indicated that it's good to invest back into NIC. How would you envision investing back into North Idaho College? Oh, yeah, and so what I mean is um, really invest. It's a, it, it, when you have, when I think when you're in a strong, like in a fair and pretty good strong position, then you have the opportunity to invest into the future. And that's what I was, that's what I was alluding to. Uh, it, it's an opportunity to look beyond maybe the here and now, but look at how what is the next what are the next things in, in higher ed that we should be doing to meet the needs of the training and education needs of the area. So that's what I was meaning about investing like that. That make, does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I would say that's investing back too because it's seeing how we can move our stance. Great. You have a question now. Yeah. Okay. Well, college as a five member board of trustees. Um, have you had experience working with a board of trustees? And what is your philosophy in terms of working with a board of trustees as a college president? Yeah, so I work, um, you know, I've not been the president, so I don't work directly in that way, but uh, I've been involved in it with, we have a board of governors, it's much larger. Um, it's appointed by the governor uh, in, in West Virginia. So that, 
that's how that process works. My experience has been, you know, I promote the academic student affairs pieces. Uh, we have um, collaborative, like professional development launch or like, trainings that are part of our launches, like how launches are in zones. Uh, we actively present and engage with them there. Uh, then I serve as, you know, I'm on the one, I'm on one of the board committees that presents the items through um, the academic student affairs side, any policies, uh, program reviews, and those kinds of things. So my experience is really to, you know, you interact very, uh, you know, openly in those ways with those groups and get to know them uh, as individuals and how what their interests are related to what the institution does. Again, we have a pretty large board. I think it's like 12 or something, 12 or 15 members. I didn't say that number before, but it's a lot larger than five. Um, and so they all have kind of different things that are of interest around the institution. And I think it's important to provide the information that we can and to create, you know, I think stories that you can you can help to tell about the benefits and the, and the success of the institution. Um, so that's been my experience there. I believe in transparency and openness. So how we can collaborate to move together, I think, is a is a big part part of it. And I think again, we're all on the same we all have the same mission. We want to serve students. That's what we're hoping to do. We're hoping to serve our community and our students. And how can we all do that? We all have different ways that we can accomplish that. John, mm -hmm. you have first question. <clears throat> you may be biased to this question. Tell me how you deal with full time versus adjunct staff. <laughs> Um, so I think there's always opportunities to bring more adjunct um, staff in uh, and, and faculty into that. And, and that's what you were saying, right? Yeah. Part time versus full time. Correct. Yeah. And we always have opportunities to bring adjunct staff into the fold of, of, of instruction. Um, I know, you know, I think that you can't do, you can't offer everything you do without every all of those players. And really providing more professional development, tying them into things like, um, you know, how you how you're delivering courses, how we provide more pedagogy training, and all those things are really important across the board. Uh, but also being clearly involved in shared governance to the extent they want to be. A lot of adjuncts around us, they they have other jobs, and so their their role is, uh, you know, they they don't want a significant role, but they do want resources and they want us to provide assistance and. So I think you need, you know, you need both pieces. You can't deliver the whole opportunity and the flexibility that really is what is needed going forward. We're going to have to continue to be more flexible. Uh, and I think those are really developing the skills, looking at, uh, you know, how everybody's a partner in that, in that delivering um, instruction. How do we develop? How do we make sure that there isn't fringe and that you're part of the team is all important. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Great. No. You've not had a lot of experience dealing with political entities for the institution. Is that understanding? Yeah, correct. Here you would have to deal with multiple levels within state government, county government, city government. Um, what is your philosophy in terms of dealing with those entities? Yeah, um, well, I think, so my, my, again, I think my, my philosophy is collaboration and partnership. So I look at how, how can we, you know, how can we serve? I, you know, I would go to the part to say, how can we serve those groups and meet those kind of policy objectives that we're trying to accomplish together for a community, for the benefit of our community? Uh, so that's my philosophy is working, working that way. You know, there's everybody's got a kind of competing needs. There's different parts. How can we provide more workforce training or, you know, even for their leadership? Uh, that's been some examples of things that we've seen uh, that, you know, even in K-12, one of the things that we found was that they need more IT assistance. They need more pipelines of IT people to work in K-12. Uh, and so one of the areas of opportunity there was to, you know, create more internet opportunities for those kind of students. So, as far as my philosophy of that, I think it's key to be partner. I, and I'm not just, uh, I don't want to go just asking for things, you know, that's never going to work. And I think the key is to see how we can partner and, and work together and, and really rise the, the significance and, and, uh, of all those agencies and entities together. Um, I'll say, I will say that on the state level at higher ed, I'm pretty involved in that. I serve on a couple of committees with our state, state office. We're not, we have an independent board at the local level. 
but um, we have we actually because we are an institution that has bachelor's degrees as well we're the only community college where community college offers two year or four year degrees as well um, we actually are, have to answer both to, to the community's technical college system and the four year system um, and so I have to kind of work within those things pretty regularly around the policies and, and those pieces that relate to academics and affairs so I'm involved in the committees on purpose so that I know what's going on and when things are changing I get to know what's happening and I think that's important to have that feedback point and be trusted person to that they reach out to see like, how do you think this impacts your institution and I think those getting involved not just uh, at the president level but other levels getting involved in those things is also really important to connecting those resources and also serving collective need. Thank you. <clears throat> John, do you have anything? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, there's been an issue that's kind of raised its head in the state, uh, uh, CRT. Can you define that for me and tell me how that fits into the curriculum? Um, yeah, critical race theory. Um, it's a kind of a li legal principle of uh, jurisprudence that talks about uh, that that's the cause of certain things. Um, that that's the root cause. How does it fit in the curriculum? Um, I've not been heavily involved in, in fitting that into curriculum at our institution. Uh, I would say that there's um, a lot of that's a national conversation that's occurring and how does it relate to you know how we understand society and how it's moved forward is something that's going to continue to be talked about and, 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 and brought into the, into the fold I think. Um, so I don't have a I don't have a lot of experience around doing that in our institution. Um, it's come up, we've talked about it. People haven't moved it too far in our area, but it, that's been my experience. And I haven't been on the forefront of it. Thank you. We have a uh, very good working relationship with the local hospital system here in Berlin. <laughs> have you had experience dealing with a hospital where you work? in terms of uh, programs that fit both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we, we're pretty close partner with ours. Um, and because, well, one, we've done things like uh, uh, training opportunities for them, particularly around their leadership. As, as any organization grows, when you're trying to, you have a lot of people, when you grow in size, then you need more leadership training. So one of the things that we've done is created like that and kind of opportunity for their specifically for their workers. Uh, and we've, we partnered to help on those training needs on that side. Uh, but very specifically, one of the areas, we have a patient care tech program. Uh, we started that, it used to be a CNA program. It was kind of transitioned into the patient care tech because CNA is uh, primarily, you have to have clinical experience in nursing homes. Uh, and it's hard to get that experience because a lot of hospitals got rid of long-term care. Anyway, it's, uh, maybe that's too nuanced of an answer. But um, patient care tech is a, is a role within our hospitals also. And so we provided an opportunity for their, instead of them doing in-house training of their patient care tech, which that was one of the models, that's a CNA model as well. A lot of times as the employer will bring in somebody train them to be a, CN, a CNA to get their licensure to work in their facility. So it's like a paid training opportunity. So what we did with our hospital was actually say, well, we can, we can provide that training opportunity here. Uh, and we do it through a degree program. And then part of their experience is actually that learn and earn component that they can have them on their campus, like on their site. So they're getting work experience while they're going through the program. Uh, and that was an, an enables them to have a pipeline of employees in that particular career area, uh, but also to it provides enrollment for us, but it also provides like that good collaboration. That then there are other students that can take advantage of that opportunity that don't work there at the moment that might in the future. Um, we are always looking at how can we help for the healthcare needs. Uh, you know, it's a shortage in all levels. We have, I mean, we partner directly with them, all the hospitals in our area. Uh, we have two that are really close, some other a little bit farther away, hours away, or about an hour away uh, for clinical sites. So they're always involved in the advisory committees, what it is that the program's delivering on the RN level. We do that with Surge Tech as, all, as well. And those things are really important, I think, to really partner and make sure you meet those needs. Um, right now, our latest thing is that pharmacy techs 
are in need in our area, and a lot of times the pharmacies have all hired them and done them work, uh, you know, on the job training, uh, and that's left something to be desired from their perspective, uh, because you're racing somebody in and they haven't to not know what to do quite yet, um, and so that's another opportunity that's really come out of the hospital relationship. So all those I think are really important. There's lots of opportunities in healthcare, that's for sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions by board members? Mr. Chairman, I have one more. Please. Uh, tell me your thoughts on tenure. Tenure? Yeah, so I mean, I think you have to analyze tenure and whether and everything about how it you know relates to college, to the college mission and how it meets the needs in the long term. Um, you know, my institution that I've been has people that are tenured, but we haven't had a tenure track for some like 15 years. Uh, and so uh, that's been, it has, I, I think the, the negatives have outweighed the, um, or sorry, the benefits are really of not having, I'm saying this all wrong by double negative, so let me start <laughs> over. <laughs> that's, a, that's the lawyer in me. I just like want to say like you qualify every term. Sorry about that. Um, the benefits of not having a tenure track uh, aren't really, I, I think you have some because there's some flexibility in program design and development uh, that, that I don't believe is really outweighed uh, never considering it. And so I think there's opportunity to consider it in particular areas that make sense in the long term. Uh, you know, I think it has the opportunity right now, being able to staff and, and, and hire and retain people, I think that it, it could play a significant role in how that goes forward, particularly for other institutions to move on that. You know, some state legislatures have totally gotten away from it. They say it's not even a thing anymore. Um, so. There's a lot of discussion around that. So, you know, I see that there's pros and cons to all of it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Madam Perian, thank you for coming out. And we look forward to your opportunity tomorrow to see Parker and see the Air Force training session. Um, I hope your visit here is pleasant. I hope your travel back is safe. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you having me. This meeting is adjourned.